Okay, here we're going to look at some more examples of limits involving trig functions. And in my very first example, I'm going to I'm going to definitely make use of these 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 limit results that that we mentioned previously. So part C here, we have the limit as theta approaches zero. We've got cosine theta minus one over sine theta. Again, to get started, the first thing I always do is I plug in the value. So theta is approaching zero. So we would have cosine zero minus one over sine of zero. So again, I'm just replacing my theta with zero. Well, cosine of zero is one. So we have one minus one in the numerator. Sine of zero is also zero. Well, then we've got zero over zero. And this is what's known as an indeterminate form. An indeterminate form. So when we say an indeterminate form, what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is we simply can't determine the value of this limit. We can't say, oh, you know, since there's a zero in the denominator, it's undefined. Um, we can't say anything about this. It may turn out to be zero. It may turn out to be some type of infinity. It may turn out to be a, a specific, uh, some, some finite number. So this is the idea. We just simply, we just simply don't know at this point. So if we don't know, what do we do? Well, typically you do some sort of either algebraic manipulation or you do some sort, um, often with trig, you'll use some sort of trig identities. And we'll see that um, in a moment, an example like that. But okay, so when I look at this, you know, again, to, to go back to these identities, notice in the numerator we have cosine theta minus one. Well, one of our limits was if we had cosine theta minus one divided by theta, well, so long as theta was approaching zero, we knew that that was zero. And likewise, if sine of theta was being divided by theta, we had a nice result for that. We said that that equals one. Well, I look at this and I say, well, you know, those almost look like th those, those results. The only thing we need is we need the numerator to be divided by theta, and we need the denominator to also be divided by theta. Well, that's perfectly legal to do. We could multiply the numerator by 1 over theta. Well, we would also have to multiply the denominator by 1 over theta, but that's exactly what we want. So now we've got the limit as theta approaches 0. In the numerator, we would have cosine theta minus 1, all divided by theta. And there's my big original fraction. And then in the denominator, we would have sine theta divided by theta. And now I'm just going to use those results that we had from the first page. So the limit as theta approaches 0 of cosine theta minus 1 over theta, that was 0. Sine theta over theta, that was 1. So we're left with 0 over 1, or 0 as our solution. So, you know, it was really close to those, those uh, limit results. And, OK, hey, if we just divide numerator and denominator by theta, we're in business. So that's kind of the trick on the first one, or I guess the observation. Um, shouldn't really call it a, a trick. OK, part D, we've got the limit as theta approaches 0. We've got sine of cosine theta divided by secant theta. So the first thing I'm going to do, um, and maybe I've done enough limits, I should be able to evaluate these. I'm going to simply substitute theta n equals 0. But before I think about what secant of 0 is, secant is the same thing as 1 over cosine. So I'm going to go ahead and just rewrite it like that, because that's how my brain processes it. So let's see, if we substitute in theta equals uh, 0, we'll have sine of cosine of 0. Then we've got 1 over cosine of 0. Well, I think this one, uh, we're in business. So cosine of 0 is simply going to be equal to positive 1. So in the denominator, we would have 1 over positive 1. Well, so in the denominator, we just have 1. So we're left with sine of 1 over 1, which is simply sine of 1. And without a calculator, that's not a value that I could easily compute. I mean, the only, the only values I can really plug into a trig function are, again, those common pi over 2, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 6, some multiple of those. One definitely doesn't fit the bill. 
So on a, a test or a quiz, if I didn't have a calculator, well, I would definitely leave the solution as sine of 1. Even if I did have a calculator, I would leave it as sine of 1, because then it's exact. So, okay, so so part, uh, part D was another problem where we could simply just, you know, plug and chug. Okay, let's look at part E as well. So we've got the limit as x approaches pi over 4. We've got sine x minus cosine x divided by cosine of 2x. So if we substitute in excuse me, if we substitute in pi over 4 for x, we'll have sine of pi over 4 minus cosine of pi over 4. And then we've got cosine of 2 times pi over 4. So in the numerator, we have the square root of 2 over 2 minus the square root of 2 over 2. In the denominator, well, 2 times pi over 4, right? 2 times pi over 4. If we simplify, that's just going to be 2 pi over 4 or pi over 2. So really, we've got cosine of pi over 2 in the denominator. But cosine of pi over 2 equals 0. So really what we're left with, if we simplify again, we're really left with this indeterminate form 0 over 0. So again, I think, well, OK, I can't say it's 0. I can't say it's undefined. I can't really say anything at this point. So it's indeterminate, which means I've got to be clever and come up with some, some better argument as to what's going on. All right, so again, a very common thing when you have trig functions, especially if you have, you know, cosine of 2x or sine of 2x, it seems like these problems are often set up to use, to use a, a trig identity. So we've got the limit as x approaches pi over 4. So I'm going to leave the numerator alone. But an identity for cosine of 2x, we can use the identity cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And again, you may think, well, why does this necessarily help? And the thing that I recognize is this denominator is a difference of perfect squares. It's a difference of perfect squares. And that means that we can factor it. Okay, so that means we can factor it. And then hopefully by factoring, that's going to help us simplify some stuff down. So I have the limit as x approaches pi over 4. Again, the, the numerator I'm just leaving alone. So I've got something squared minus something squared. We can factor this, our cosine squared minus sine squared. We can factor that as cosine x minus sine x. And then we would have cosine x plus sine x. Okay, so now what I want to start trying to do is I want to. Uh, my goal is hopefully to get a, a common uh, a factor in the numerator and denominator and cancel those out, and then hopefully that'll that'll help me. Well, we've got a, a negative sign in the numerator, so we've got cosine plus sine. Can't do anything with that. But in the denominator, I've got cosine x minus sine x. Now, we have to be careful. We can't just immediately cancel those out because we have a positive sine and a negative cosine. Here we've got a positive cosine and a negative sine. So when you have sort of uh, everything almost correct but just opposite signs, what we do in this case is we can factor out a negative 1. And for some reason, this, this uh, I guess maybe, for some reason, I don't know, this used to always, in a sense, for some reason it used to bother me. I don't know why. Um, but again, all you're doing is you're just doing a very simple algebraic manipulation. And you could factor the negative out of the numerator or the denominator. Let's maybe just factor it out of the numerator. So suppose I pull a negative 1 out. Well, all I'm really thinking is negative 1 multiplied by what would give me a positive sine x? Well, I guess we would need negative sine x. And then negative 1 multiplied by what would give me negative cosine x? Well, we would need positive cosine x. Notice if I, you know, distribute, again, I'm going to get exactly what I had back in the numerator. So 
this is perfectly valid in terms of algebra, right? I mean, if we if we undo what we just did, we get everything back. And that's that's the whole point of algebra. The bottom part I'm leaving alone. So again, it's not like I'm multiplying. I'm not multiplying the numerator by negative one, right? All I'm doing is factoring it out, and that's, I think, the, the distinction that's worth pointing out because I think that's something that confuses people. They see a negative one magically in the numerator, and they say, well, you've got to do it to the denominator, but again, we're not multiplying the numerator by negative one. We're factoring it out, okay? So, and now the point is, again, you could rewrite it. I'm not going to take this step. Now the point is I do have a positive cosine x. I could rewrite this, this term, this factor, as cosine x minus sine x. Well, I've got cosine x minus sine x in the denominator, so now I can cancel these out. Okay, those are the exact same thing, and that's the whole point of doing this. So now we're left with the limit as x approaches pi over 4. We're left with the negative 1 in the numerator. We've still got our cosine x plus sine x in the denominator. And now if we substitute in x equals pi over 4, we've got negative 1 in the numerator. Uh, we've seen cosine of pi over 4, that's square root of 2 over 2. Sine of pi over 4 is going to be square root of 2 over 2. And now to me it's just a matter of maybe cleaning this up a little bit. So we're almost there. Okay, so we would have square root of 2 over 2 plus square root of 2 over 2. That'll give us 2 square root of 2 over 2 in the denominator. Again, we could simply cancel out those 2's. Now we're left with negative 1 over square root of 2. Some people do not like to see radicals in the denominator. Um, I still don't know why. I, there's not a good reason. I, I've asked lots of people, you know, um, why is that? I, I've heard varying reasons, and I think if you ask a lot of teachers, they probably won't give you a good reason. And I can't think of, some people just say it's easier to think about the number, you know, if you were to sort of calculate this in your head, what is 1 divided by square root of 2? I don't know. A lot of times if you rationalize the denominator, maybe it's easy to sort of internalize the value of that number. But I haven't come ac across a great reason. Um, some people say it has to do with round off error. I've spoke to computer scientists, they say that's hooey. Um, so again, but whatever, uh, sorry to digress, I am going to rationalize the denominator. So to get rid of the square root of 2 in the denominator, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by square root of 2. So in the numerator, we would be left with negative square root of 2. Square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. And hey, after much work, that will be our solution. Negative square root of 2 over 2.